Right, well, whilst we're just uh, dealing with technology, so um, this is now, um, I'm glad to uh, have learnt uh, Dr. Jennifer Curry-Joseph, who got her PhD from UP um, on same-sex um, desire, and who's going to talk to us about uh, the Chico Dam, but I think also something of her uh, thesis uh, interests uh, as well. And we've got it up. Wonderful. Thank you. Magandang umaga. Ah, tanghali na pala. Malapit ng maghapon sa atin. Um, I hope I don't go through another defense sa <laughs> ngayong tanghali. But I'm going to share with you an excerpt from a chapter of my dissertation which I defended I don't remember anymore. May, I think? Last May. So, very new. So this is the very long title of my dissertation. It's called Bontok and Northern Kankanay, Tomboy and Bakla Identities and Desires, Spaces, Intimate Bodies, Histories, and Memories. Because it, I got diverted from my original topic uh, just to provide the context and, and a background. I wanted to do a study on Igorot tomboys. That was it. That's what I wanted to do because I've been basically, I'm not an Igorot, I don't, I'm not an Ilocano, I'm, I'm a Tagalog from Marikina, but I studied in Baguio, so I've been based in Baguio for, I think, 30 years, more than half of my life. So I, through the years, we've been noticing a lot of tomboys and bakla uh, in Baguio City, so we were wondering, where are they coming from? They say they, they're from the mountain province. So how come there are a lot of transgenders and bakla from the mountain province when they don't have kids? So how do they multiply? So what's, what's, what's happening in mountain province? And specifically, uh, they come from Tadian, Tadian mountain province. So, so yung mga taga Tadian or taga mountain province, they are familiar that you, you know that it's called the gay capital of the Cordilleras. <laughs> I don't know if it's the gay capital of the Philippines. But... They, they really come from Tadian, and so back in 2008, during the first International Con Cordillera Studies Conference in 2008, we had delegates from Tadian, coming from Tadian, but are now, we're then based in Baguio. So, so they said, so JJ, you're doing studies on LGBT. Uh, why don't you study the bakla and the tomboys from the Tadian? Because we have a lot. What do you mean a lot? We have multiple bakla and tomboy within and across generations. So... Really, sabi ko gano. So, maraming anecdotes. So there are a lot of stories and anecdotes about this. So, it took me, so 2008, serious studying 2011, exploratory 2011. So, ito yung, this is part of my dissertation. Okay, As, I'm sorry, I have to do this. Because it's stipulated in my grant contract. <laughs> So, of course, I'd like to thank the tomboy, the bakla, the minamag kit, which I will explain later. I tried to remove all the LGBT, sexuality, gender jargon from, from my presentation. The elders, uh, the elders were, the, were among the last generation of those who went to the, the atu and the ulog. And, but my tomboy, bakla, minamag kit informants were among the first ones who did not go through the mandatory uh, going through these homosocial institutions of the Atu and the Ulub. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank, of course, the University of the Philippines, and very importantly, the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research of University of Amsterdam, the Mercedes Conception Research Grant of the Philippine Population Association, and UN UNFPA. Of course, Cordillera Studies Center Research Grant, baka isumbong ako ni Ikim, at ng iba pang taga UP Baguio, of course, Drs. Michael Lintan, my advisor, my Dulce Natividad, the co-advisor and reader, and ang aking lola, ang Tina, na ay June Pril Brett, na mar I gave her so many episodes of hyperventilation. <laughs> Maybe Billy is aware of that. And Professors Nestor Castro and Maria Luisa Camagay. Okay, now, this is my study sites. Uh, these are my study sites. So, so June Pril Brett, correct? Characteristically, would say, JJ, you cannot just focus on Tadian. You have to do comparative. So why don't you include Bontok? Of course, the, her bias is she comes, she comes from Alab and Tukukan Bontok. So okay, so I have an agricultural area. I have a trading center area. When while you're at it, why don't you include Sagada? So you have a tourism, agriculture, <laughs> trading center, and do not limit yourself to the lem to the tomboys. Uh, include the bakla. So, it took me 
longer. <laughs> because I wanted to do, as I, as I said earlier, I wanted to do a study on lesbians because I feel that there are a lot of gays, Filipino gays. You have Michael Lintan, uh, Neil Garcia, Martin Manalansan, uh, etc. So for, uh, for the lesbians, nobody's doing serious academic work. Wala na ba si Dr. Kirk dito? <laughs> I presented last year sa anthropological conference, Anthro at 100 at Yipi Diliman. So I presented, and then she was the first one to raise her hand. Positive naman, even if she's here, I will, I will tell the story. So, I've seen JJ around Yipi Baguio, and I never realized she was serious with her work. <laughs> so I turned beet red. <laughs> Is that a compliment or an insult, di ba? <laughs> Hayaan ko na lang, may, I'll take it as a compliment. Wala na siya, di ba? <laughs> So, Bontok, Sagada, and Tadyan. Okay, why these three study areas? So, co high concentration of tomboys, baklayan, transgenders, and reports of high level of acceptance among the families and the general community. So, my lowland, bourgeois, UP education did not prepare me for, for the things that I discovered. So, so I why your society had taken practices? In fact, when I was there late last year, yata, uh, we, ha we had to we had to evacuate because there was a tribal war. They were fighting about the water source, and there was a guns were involved. So it's it's serious when guns are in already involved. So, so sabi ni Junbet, uh, provide ethnolinguistic, cultural, economic diversity. So familiar. So this is courtesy of Itlato, uh, Joey Lopez. If you're from Bontok, you probably know him. This is the Maligang Rice Services. This is Sagada. Uh, if you've been to Sagada recently, almost every available space is, is, there's construction. There's construction boom for the past 10 years, I believe. So every space for hostel, hotels, uh, restaurants, souvenir shops, etc. This is Stadian. Um, mainly agricultural community, no mining enterprise, but <laughs> the, bakla, the pioneer bakla parlaristas, those who work in beauty parlors, were originally from Tadyan. We don't know why, I'm still investigating that. This is Mount Mogao, or more popularly known as Mount Clitoris. So this is the picture of Mount Mogao, Mogao so you can draw your own conclusions. I encircled the, the, the mountain. Okay. When I arrived in Sagada, naglani ako sa Sagada, my first night, and then my second night in Sagada, I had, I had dinner with the, some of the elites of Sagada. Ano ko, kalad ka rin so, they say, oh, you come with me, I have dinner with this, per, with this friend of mine. Because there were uh, foreign in, academics and researchers who came to Sagada during the time that I was there. So I got invited also to this dinner. And then during the dinner conversation, oh, how come you're researching tomboys and les and, and bakla in Sagada? I don't think there are tomboys and lesbians in Sagada. No, wala daw. So, and go, really? Are you serious? <laughs> but anyway, so it's very important who you talk to. Do not talk to the elites because they are in denial. <laughs> they, they will say they do not have tomboys and bakla in the community. I even asked for help from this person recommended by Alice Foliosco, a very knowledgeable source in the Cordillera, who said, yeah, you go to Manang, some, Manang X, she, she can probably help you. I think she is a lesbian. She's tomboy, but she, I don't think she's out. But you can ask her if you can interview her. So I, I go to her office and I say, I, uh, she's, she looks like a cowboy. Cowboy, tomboy, closeted. So she said, I don't think there are lesbians and gays in, in, in Sagada. So I look at her, I look very feminine, ultra feminine next to her. And she, she says, ultra feminine, huh? super mega feminine. And look at me. <laughs> so she said, I don't think there are lesbians, I don't think I can I recommend tomboys here in Sagada or bakla. One week after I find out, she has nephews from one brother, one brother only, four bakla nephews. But anyway, so yun yung ating background story. 
So what I found in Sagada, in Tadian, and in Bontok, the gender identities are confined to the tomboy, the bakla, and in Bontok particularly, you have the minamagkit. Okay, it comes from the word mamagkit. They coined, they invented this word minamagkit. So mamagkit means a young lady or a maiden. So minamagkit is like a young lady kaslanga. Kaslanga. Balasa. Okay, so they invented that. They even called their organization minamagkit. Yes, they, they have an organization called minamagkit. Um, so these are the things, the significant findings. So ABC, body, sexual practices of the tomboy, bakla, minamagkit, and transgenders. Uh, notice that I will always, I would always use bakla, tomboy, and minamagkit, and refrain from using lesbian, gay, transgenders, trans men, trans women. Bakla beauty parlor, this is the, actually this is the most developed chapter in my dissertation. Beauty parlor as lived in bakla space, and the third one, ito yung, the intimate relationships between bakla, minamagkit, and the government soldiers stationed in Mountain Province during the period of the Chico River Dam conflict in the 1970s and throughout the militarization in the 1990s. This, my paper is the first documentation and publication of this um, phenomenon. I was surprised to find out about this. Okay. So this is one talk now. This is taken from, I don't remember, Konsanian. don't remember from where, but this is one talk last year, taken last year. So this is the one talk uh, central district. And one of the things that came in in the 1970s and 1980s was the women beauty parlors, which were eventually transformed into the bakla beauty parlor. So now when you think of beauty parlor, especially in the Philippines, you always associate it with the bakla. Okay. So I filmed the bakla beauty parlor as live spaces, bakla spaces. For the bakla, the beauty parlor is very important for two things. For economic transformation, why? Because dirt poor. Most of my informants are come from very poor families with many children, so they could not send their children to school. And because of the, I make aware because of the influence of the Episcopalians, so education is very important. So you need to have education. So you go to Bontoc or to Baguio or elsewhere to get your college education. So the bakla now goes to the beauty parlor, hangs out and become apprentices of the older bakla in who owns or operates the beauty parlor. So economically, it's a way to earn a degree and eventually a livelihood. Some of them even own their beauty parlors. Okay. Aside from the economic, it's also, um, it's more than just livelihood. It's a symbol of space or, and space for transformation beyond economics. It's their bakla space. It's where they experiment and forge their bakla or minamagkat identities. They form long-term relationships with other bakla, um, social networks, economic networks, and that's also where they find relationships. So I said, ay, parang ibgan, parang olog, just like the olog and the ibgan. Of course, the hyper ventilates si John Prilbret. <laughs> That is sacred. That is sac sacrosanct. Do not make that connection. I will kill you. I will kill you. <laughs> so if she's not hyperventilating when I s send her an email, a document, I think it's positive. She is not calling me. She's not calling me to come to Baguio immediately for a meeting. When I see Dr. John Pilbert. <laughs> but I love her, of course. Okay. Um, very interesting history. I also use the lens of historical revisionism. Uh, in the course of my research, I find that there are two kinds. There's the negative kind and the positive kind. Historical negationism is what they do with the Holocaust or the comfort women. 
um, sorry, Japanese uh, sex slaves, and that's what they're doing now. They even they're trying to expunge the Cory Cory period from the official Gazette of the Philippines. It came out just yesterday. So, but there's a good kind. It's called um, historical revisionism. When you find new evidence or the political military climate is now more conducive for you to bring out your data and your analysis. So that is what the positive kind is what I'm trying to do. So there I, I, I found out that there are two um, major narratives. One about the Chico River struggle. Of course there's historical negationism there by Marcos in the World Bank, etc. But I'm, for this paper, I'm focusing on the, histori the narratives of the Bakla and the Minamagkit. So I want to finally bring them out and so that they can be part of the historical discourses. Okay, this is Bontok Town Plaza. Ngayon. This is, I think, taken 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So there's Changge because we have, in the Philippines, we have a lot of fiestas and festivals. So there was Amamang and what's the other one? Langai. So this was taken, I think, in between these two festivals. So Madaming uh, Changge flea markets, so the, tar the tarpaulins. This is the site where the young Minamagkit, the young Bakla, okay, were picked up or that's where they have their sexual debut with tourists, both foreign and lo local. So my Australian, my local tourist. And also, this is where the young bakla in the 1980s would wait for the young soldiers to come out of the bars drunk and they will have sex somewhere in the dark places around Bontok Centro. Okay, so how that plays with Inayan, because it's taboo to have sex outdoors for the Bontok. But maybe they, ah, but eventually they go to the military camp. And outside the military camp, there are houses or what they call puesto or stations where they can have sex. Or in the boarding houses of the Bakla Pylorista, they live with some of the soldiers and officers. Okay. So there's a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship here between the bakla and the soldiers. Remember, these soldiers were also young. In their early 20s, the bakla, the Minamagkit, were in their late teens and early 20s also. Exploring, exploring, discovering their sexual and gender identities. Okay, what were the context? So, we try to stay away from factors, variables. So, what were the context and processes that made this possible? One, prevalence of sexual norms that discourage local young women from socializing and forming even friendships, more so intimate relationships with the soldiers. That's not allowed. Local women, if they get interested with soldiers, the, the local women will not be accepted in the few hotels or, lo or lodging houses, but they also cannot have sex outdoors because it's taboo or it's not permitted by their culture. You will displease the gods and nature and the life statuses will fall. Um, no organized prostitution or institutionalized red light district where, where there's militarization in military camps, usually prostitution comes in or the red light district. In Montauk, there's none. These were young, lonely, and bored soldiers and officers and officers crossing paths with accommodating young, exploring bakla and minamagkit. Uh, what else? The preference of the bakla and minamagkit for secret sexual encounters with transient populations like the soldiers and tourists. Um, losing face is very important. I don't want to have sex with a local boy and then the next day the, oh, the whole town will know about it. So I'd rather have the sexual liaisons with strangers, with transient populations. Gay sex in the military is commonplace, except that 
There is a distinction between homosexual identity and same-sex sexual practices. The practice is there, but the, the identity may not follow. Uh, Jane Ward, in her recent book, documented this. Heterosexual credentials and masculinity of the heterosexually identified soldiers are not diminished by homosexual sex, provided that they always play the main role, which is the penetrator or the insert the insertor in anal sex, but also always the receiver in oral sex. That's very clear. We can't have demonstrations here. Okay. <laughs> Reflections. Uh, the consideration of gender and sexual identities in bakla and tomboy. I'm saying that there's false equivalence between gay vis-a-vis -vis the bakla or minamagkit and lesbian and tomboy. They are not equivalent. And for the bakla and tomboy in Tadyan, Sagada, and Mountain Province, they are more gender, primarily gender identities rather than sexual identities, just like we have in the United States, in Europe, uh, in Latin America, for example. Uh, this for mainly for me and for my LGBTIQ plus uh, plus <laughs> colleagues <laughs> and researchers, the need to interrogate Western concepts and paradigms and identities. For example, I, I was part of ILGA, the International Lesbian Gay Association. It's, it's actually the National Lesbian Gay Intersex Transgender. Trans, inter, I don't. I it can't keep track anymore. But to keep it simple, we just they just call it ILGA. Okay, so SOGI means sexual orientation before it, it was only S-O-G-I. So sexual orientation and gender identity. Now it's sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Now we have this long acronym and it keeps long, becoming longer and longer. So LGBTQIP2SAA++. So it's the longest acronym. Some sectors have called it initialism instead of the local labels. So if I prefer a certain label, for example, can I add my own letter there? For example, when I, 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 I kid my friends, uh, this sapiosexual lesbian is sinigang. <laughs> that means uh, you, you look up sapio, <laughs> sapio sexual. When I say sinigang, um, from months of writing, so I'm already sinigang or tostado. Well, my brains are toast. So, um, but being Filipino, I say I'm sinigang, and I also have not taken a bath in three days, so I smell like sinigang. So even the rainbow flag, which celebrated its 40th year this year. They want to add brown, and they've added the brown and black to indicate race. So my question is, when do we stop? Where do we draw the line to my LGBT++ friends? There's also this active vis -vis passive MSM gay men in U.S., European, Latin American context. These labels and categories may not be suitable or applicable in the Philippine, Cordillera, and other local contexts. There has to be contextualization. One way to waste on which are these really applicable and operant in the local context. And when you say one way, can sex really be one way, regardless of the activity? There should, it's always two way, right? Unless you're not having sex with another human being, maybe. Okay. <laughs> There's a propensity to translate or find counterpart of categories and, or labels. Local to foreign, awkward translation, inaccurate, or distortion of the meanings. Um, again, in, 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 in this particular data set, as a reconceptualization or reconsideration of the concept of sexual consent, this particularly in terms of the bakla boys, the young bakla in the ili, not necessarily in Bontok, in the Ili, being asked by the older heterosexually identified boys to give them massages. And in this context, massage means give me your hand and leading the hand towards the penis of the older boy. But according to them, they have the right. 
to refuse. If they don't like to massage the penis, <laughs> massage the older boys, they can say no. And the, the older boys will not force them. And also with the soldiers and the young bakla is the exploitation. Uh, the, the young bakla then in Bontok and the Minimagit pick the soldiers with whom they will have sex with during that night or relationships for, for as long as the soldiers were in the area. Three, four months, six months. And when the wives of the, or the girlfriends of the soldiers come to Bontok, they're all friends. So they, they, <laughs> they, the, the, the soldiers bring the wives and soldiers to the parlor and the bakla will, will take care of the beauty needs, beauty care needs of the wife and or the girlfriend. And after she leaves, the, the soldier or the officer is back in the arms of the bakla. Um, reconceptualization, one last point, reconceptualization of sexual pleasure and satisfaction. So I was trying to punish myself. How can they say they, they get sexual satisfaction when there's a physiological aspect to it? And then my one of my mentors said, why do you have to define it only in terms of physiological, in physiological terms? There can be other kinds. So there's psychological, emotional, and in the case of the bakla and the tomboys, they can even be narcissistic, vicarious, or altruistic uh, sexual pleasure. I get pleasure when I pleasure you. Or I get pleasure by the idea that I'm getting very skillful at giving pleasure. Or I get pleasure when you treat me like a woman in our love making. Salamat po. Ayan na. <laughs> what's the, uh, in, in your longest acronym, uh, I know most of those, but what's the two? What's our two spirit, two S, two, two spirit. Indigenous people in North America. Ah, so they're only spiritually... No, that was the term developed in the 80s to explain that because very many cultures had cross-dressing people who were allowed to survive and they were considered because they had two spirits, they had two spirits. both male and female. It's in a movie that I show in my class and it's, it's in the anthology. How is that different from transvestite? Well, because they had, well, they were cross-dressers, but they uh, they weren't always transvestite. Anyway, they had a place very often, a sacred spiritual space space in things like Plains Indian yeah. culture, which we also associate with hypermasculinity. Um, yeah, I have a question. What, one for June's hyperventilation, because I try to make her hyperventilate on this too. Um, did the term of the bakla parlor being the ulog come from the bakla, or is that your reading of it? No, that's my reading of okay. it. And the other one was, it's interesting when they say all the baklas are from Tadyan, because that's the first thing I ever heard in Sagada too. And at the time I discovered there was one bakla from Tadyan and all the other baklas were from Sagada. Mm -hmm. um, there is this phenomenon too in, say, India where all the uh, bartered brides are now all Biharis, because that's the poorest place. So the question is, to what extent does elite denial of bakla and tomboy's status within Sagada and places like that lead them to say everyone is from Tadyan? Is there a disproportionate number? Or is it a way of attributing it without breaking their ideas of their own heteronormativity, hypermasculinity, hyper, you know, in, in Sagada? I think among the bakla and tomboy in Sagada, so there's, no, there's no denial that there are a lot of tomboys and bakla in Sagada. What they're saying is that the first bakla, cross-dressing bakla that we saw were from Tadyan or from Bauko, and that gave us an idea that it's possible. We cannot just be male or female. There are, there are other possibilities. And this was ushered in by the coming of the Baklang Patlorista in Sagada. And but I found when I actually inquired mm -hmm. my time, a lot more of them at that time were actually not from Tadyan. So I began to wonder if this was a denial system where you just said they're all from Tadyan, except mm -hmm. that, that someone's was some. The elders, the, the elders and the more elite members of Sagadan society, That's of course there's denial. What's the STD situation there? Um, 
for the longest time, there's very little incidence of STI and HIV because the preferred sexual practice is ipit ipit. It's not anal sex. Ipit ipit. It's all. It's also found in in indigenous communities the in in South Africa in the mines in South Africa to prevent uh, teenage pregnancy. So the penis is squeezed. I don't know what to say. It's squeezed between the legs. So the rubbing. So you'd notice because the the miners the miners would take mine wives young boys as mine wives. So you'd know if these boys newly recruited into the mines are wives because you'd notice uh, very shiny legs uh, thighs of these boys lubricant. So maybe um, olive oil. <laughs> so what what do you say there is? They, uh, but now, uh, just last year, there, there have been three documented cases of HIV in Bontok. Three. And, uh, but they are alarmed because it's usually contracted either outside Mountain Province or because they contracted it with tourists or, or transient population. If, um, if uh, it's not a denial thing that uh, they're saying that the Tajang, that there are a lot of people who are gay in Tajang, um, is there some kind of cultural thing that they do in Tajang, like maybe it's more acceptable, or is there something that's different about the practices? I'm still investigating that, but because Tadian used to be the, your entry point from, from Cervantes, from, from the Ilocos, but now you will hardly see... Um, Gays, adult gays, and yeah, adult bakla, and economically reproductive age, uh, ten boys in a reproduct economically reproductive age in Tadian because not, there's nothing to do in Tadian except for agriculture. So they are mainly in Baguio, um, in Metro Manila, in the parlors, in the chain parlor beauty beauty parlor chains in in, in Manila, or in Baguio. Um, the young ones, I suppose, after high school and, and earn their college education in Baguio or Manila would also not prefer to come back to the Dian. So you now can now find them outside the Dian. So in the other places in Mountain Province where you have beauty parlors and in Baguio and in Metro Manila. The Tadian would say, I don't know, the first, the very first, in my in first encounter said, JJ, look at Tadian because maybe it's our diet. Maybe it's in our, the water or the, from local uh, plant-based diet to a high sodium, high fat, uh, <laughs> fast food. That's what they said, they told me. Or the tri-boundary situation. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe they just leave. Maybe more, more gay people leave the jam than other places in... Because of there's, there's nothing... Because there's nothing and because... Because uh, it's but, a conservative place. But why? Um, and it's it's it's. So people, you find out about it because people from outside say, "Oh, all the people I meet are from Tajan or gay." Maybe that's. The but way. it's. I find that it's true that the older bakla really come from Tajan in their sixties, in their seventies. Um, they originally from Tajan, but it's it's. So they recall, my, my, my oldest key informant is 68 years old. So he could recall in, during his boyhood, there were already bakla in Tadian. So it was not influenced from somewhere, or they have not migrated or gone elsewhere and come back to Tadian. It's organic. <laughs> yes. It's not a question, don't worry. I, mean, like, uh, I just want to share. Uh, going back to the elders of Sagada, uh, the denial thing, which elders. Uh, I've been with the elders of Sagada for quite some time now. Mm. And uh, now, these days, uh, during the uh, the bakla and the tomboy is part of the invocation uh, that when they perform the Daoists, they said they would utter that. Uh, we hope that 
and the back class would not multiply. Because of, or the tomboids. Because it's one, one reason that they won't reach, the elders won't reach the pinnacle of their stage, Stat the yeah. status in the community if they are related to a bakla. I mean, not, not because of you bakla or tomboy, because they could not multiply. And they cannot sponsor wedding feasts necessary to, to elevate and to reach the pinnacle of uh, holder, uh, the eye holder status. And I have one case like that. And, and, <laughs> I, I, no, I mean, not, I know not, too. Not only one, but I am very close to this family who had Bakla a daughter, I mean, tomboy daughter. Tomboy daughter and Bakla grandson. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking of the same person. <laughs> so the answer is legal marriage in the Philippines for people who are not so male. When I interviewed the elder, he did not tell me that I have a, a tomboy daughter. So when I, when I interviewed the daughter in Baguio, he, she also did not tell me, oh, my father is so-and-so, and he's a dap eye holder in Sagada. The first, the first, these uh, elders are frustrated, actually, that they won't reach. Although they are supposed to be on, on, the, on that stage. And they are in reality. In reality. Maybe change the criteria. Changes. <laughs> Uh, but the Philippine law changes and you can marry because it's the marriage ceremony that matters. Uh, Not the reproduction. So they shouldn't be saying, well, it's multiplied, but you can always adopt. There's always been adoption in Sagada, so that's not the issue. So it would be fun to say, if look, at if legally they can marry and you can hold the babayas, so you guys should be campaigning for legislation and not trying to change your kids. <laughs> <laughs> legislation, a lot more changeable. Or change the criteria. Even if without legal marriage, you can have the, the feast. No? Yeah, I think first the law, then the change. Okay, I think, do you want one, yeah, one, one last question? On a positive that. note, it's very good that the wives go to the beauty parlors, but um, you mentioned that, the, of the soldiers, sorry, the wives of the soldiers. So does that mean that they're kind of giving grudging acceptance, or is it that they, you think that they know they have a hint? If, if they know, they turn a blind eye, perhaps. And it's unthinkable for them, maybe. Or they would prefer the, the husband to be with a bakla than with a woman, for example. Okay. Marami pong salamat. Thank you.